Thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to talk about Campus Conversations first. It's a, is, this is the first in a series of events that we invite the campus community to come and engage with campus leadership. As you know, we've got a lot of new leaders on campus who have kind of bold and inspiring agendas that we want to share. But we really do want to make it conversational. So. Um, uh, so we invite you to ask questions. We put note cards and pencils on your chairs, and we have our student ambassadors in the room on either side of the room um, that will take the note cards and sort through them by theme, and then uh, after our speaker is finished, I'll, I'll uh, sit with her and go through the note cards and ask her the questions that you have. Um, so pass those along anytime. Just raise your hand when you've got one, and, and then you can send it down your row, and, and we'll, we'll get it um, in the stack. Um, so uh, you'll also see on your chairs is a flyer about future campus conversations. The next one's coming up in short order on uh, February 12th with our Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, Paul Elavisados. Um, he has been on campus for a long time, but new to his role, and he's got some, he'll have some interesting things to say, and I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Rosemary Ray is our Chief Financial Officer and Vice Chancellor. She's been on campus for about four years, and she brings a really rich three decades worth of experience to the task at hand, which I know you all can appreciate is quite a challenging one um, these days. <clears throat> so she has four areas within her portfolio that I wanted to mention. Uh, capital strategies, which is all the building and capital projects uh, around campus, on and around campus. Uh, the controller's office. Financial planning and analysis, which uh, has been doing an amazing job making transparent all the kind of numbers and figures and information about uh, the campus finances on their website, and then the university partnership program. Um, so I will uh, welcome Rose to the podium, and she'll speak for a few minutes, and then uh, she and I will uh, take your questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting me, and um, thank you for your uh, remarks, Diana, and I think what you mean by my richness is potentially my age, but I'll let it go. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, before we get going, um, I, I tried to anticipate uh, some of the questions that you might have that seem natural to me, and I came up with four questions of my own. Um, and I'm going to count on you to fill in the rest in terms of, of uh, questions. And I thought it might be helpful because we have such a diverse audience here today. Um, it would be really helpful for me if I could kind of find out a little bit about you before I get going. So could I just ask if you're a faculty member to raise your hand or emeriti? Yay, great. And then staff? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, students. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! You're, you're, you're carrying it for the students. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so I think that um, I appreciate that everyone is going to have different points of view and uh, has something to say, and I want to hear it. But I wanted to uh, go through the four questions, try to answer those in the first 20 minutes or so, and then we would jump into the questions. Does that sound okay with everybody? Everybody go like this, yes. I got 10 people to do that. I'm gonna take that as confirmation to go ahead. So here are my four questions. And um, I'm gonna throw some numbers at you. It is not necessary for you to write them down. We're gonna post uh, my talking points and then like a supporting deck that would have some graphs and charts that would walk you through some of the things that I talk about. We'll post that next week. I've, anticip I've got the answers to the four questions, but I wanna answer all of them. Um, if you have not been to the uh, cfo.berkeley.edu website, we post a lot of really great stuff there that uh, I think you could benefit from taking a look at. So that'll come next week. Uh, and, and the hope is that we can keep this conversational. So ready, here are my four questions. In broad strokes, how does our budget work? And what is the flow of funds around campus? That's question number one. Question number two, who makes longer term decisions regarding our budget and when are they made? So this is sort of a multi-year horizon. Question number three, who makes campus budget decisions as it relates to our annual budget, and when are they made? 
and then I hope we have an opportunity to talk about how you can influence the decisions that are made in our budgeting cycle by knowing when those decisions are made and who's making them. So that's the goal. And then number four, what are the priorities of, of our teams that um, Diana went through already, and how do we serve you? Because ultimately, my teams serve campus, serve our faculty, serve our staff, serve our students. That's our job, is to serve you. Um, and then finally, I would say that uh, it's impossible to get through all of this in an hour. And so much to my chief of staff's chagrin, I'm gonna tell you that my email address is RRAE. <laughs> I'd give you my phone number, but um, so, but RRAE, if you have other questions, you have a point of view, you have something you wanna get off your chest, I'm a phone call away. Please, I'd much rather you reach out to me so that we can create a virtuous cycle of, of, of conversation that we take out of this room. So uh, l let's tackle question number one, which, probably seems like forever ago that I talked about what the questions were, but in broad strokes, how does our budget work and what is the flow of funds? And if you're coming in, there are seats right up here by me <laughs> if you wanna come on up here. Um, yeah, nobody wants to get too close to the CFO. So our, our budget story actually begins in something that we call the central ledger. Uh, so you could think about this like a big pot uh, in which in which we record the tuition that's charged to our students, but not all of the tuition, state support, indirect cost recovery, and other fees uh, for, for the campus. And then we record some, some expenses there that are not a, a, a directly attributable to any one unit or division. And those are things like uh, the assessments that we pay to the Office of the President. And then the largest disbursement that we make out of this central ledger is uh, through allocations. And we distribute about $1.4 billion worth of allocations out of this big pot. Um, we have a budget in total that is about $2.7 billion. And that's inclusive of our contracts and grants. So we're big and we're complicated. On the revenue side, inside the central ledger, uh, we record state support of about $375 million, and I'm, I am rounding way up, so I try to think in like $25 million chunks here, so it, it, they're, they're, these are all approximate figures. That's about 14% of our budget, and I'm going to come back and talk about state support and tuition, especially in light of the Regents meeting yesterday, which I assume some of you might have questions about a little later. We record about $700 million of tuition and fees. Of that, about $225 million of that is non-resident supplemental tuition. It's an important part of our budget. And just um, to give you a sense of that, that makes up about uh, almost 25% of our undergraduate body. We also record current use gifts and endowment payout that's not recorded at the division level. That's about $60 million. And then we also record investment income, uh, and that primarily comes off of the interest that we earn on our cash balances of about $72 million. And I mentioned earlier that we also record indirect cost recovery there. So that's what happens, that kind of adds up to 1.4 billion. Things you know, flow right through the, the central ledger. And on the ex expense side, uh, let me lay that out for you. The things that are not direct, directly charged to divisions or units, I'm kind of using that language um, interdependently, is uh, we, we spend about $60 million on UCOP assessments or the Office of President assessments, and that includes things for charges like the UC PATH project. Um, it also uh, pays for, I, I'm not sure everyone would know, but there's a pool uh, that we pay into that provides scholarship to our students. It's called Return to Aid. We, that's a system-wide program, and, and um, we, we have an expense associated with that. Uh, and then finally, we support the operations of the Office of the President. So the rest of that is, uh, flows right back out again in terms of allocations to, to the divisions. And it's complicated in that sometimes those allocations are made 
to a, a school or a college or you know, a VC level, and sometimes they're made to departments. So there's 42, four, two, 42 of those allocations that get made out of the center. And they've, they, they're just, some of them are a historic artifact, and some of those allocations reflect priorities that are set by campus. So um, you might be wondering if that's, you know, what happens, where is the $2.7 billion of our budget? And I wanna present it to you in like three big buckets. And the first big bucket is our academic units, schools and colleges, and then we also include in this um, what are called other academic units. Examples might be the library is a good example of that. And that budget that our, our academy uh, is about $1.6 billion of our $2.7 billion budget. Remember how I said we make these allocations out of uh, the central ledger? Well, the academic units get about $700 million of that $1.4 billion that we allocate out. And then they also have their own activity. They have contracts and grants of about $450 million, and then they receive fees from things like PDST, self-supporting degree programs. That's about $300 million. And then they also have their own gifts, their own endowment payout, and that's about $200 million. So that's what the size of the, ac the academy is. Aren't you glad I'm gonna put this all on my website so you don't have to remember this? There's no quiz at the end. Um, then we have the Vice Chancellor of Research. Uh, that is about a $300 million budget. To, 50 of it comes from central support, some sales, some gifts, and then the biggest chunk, contracts and grants. Don't forget that the academic units are also recording their own contracts and grants. And then finally, because there was a lot of folks that raised their hands when we talked about staff, um, there is a, about a $900 million uh, budget for central support units. And by that, uh, I, some, some folks refer to this as the administration. I'm using the central support units uh, deliberately because it's inclusive of student affairs, uh, uh, equity and inclusion, finance, capital strategies, and then administration as well. So, so uh, $900 million budget there. About half of that comes from central support, which is surprising, I think, and encouraging. And then 250 million of that comes through auxiliaries. So housing, for instance, is part of this portfolio, and that's a big revenue driver. All right, um, so that's a little bit about the big context of how funds flow around campus. You've got this central ledger, uh, we're, we're collecting in revenues, and then they're being distributed out to, to different units around campus. Uh, so question number two was, who makes longer term budget decisions and when are they made? There are a lot of people who contribute to budget decisions as we think about this in the longer term. And many of those people are not here at Berkeley. If we only had to make decisions at Berkeley, what a delicious thing that would be. But um, the influencers, when you are a public university, are, are, many of them are external. It's the Office of the President, it's our Regents, it's the Foundation, it's the Board of Visitors, it's my favorite, the California Department of Finance, they're my buds, and uh, the legislature and the public. So we're really, juggling a lot of different perspectives and priorities. Um, you know, as an editorial note, I would say that no matter which side of the tuition increase issue that you're on, the decision about when we're gonna make the decision about tuition, which is May, is, is really a challenge for us for planning at Berkeley. Right? It's, a, it's a big driver in our budget, and it's, it's, it, it's a challenge. Uh, I feel like Captain Obvious in that statement. Um, that the the um, chancellor and the provost are also passionately uh, representing the interests of our, our students and, and their families uh, for their own financial planning and campus, uh, and, and they think very deeply about balancing the needs of faculty and staff and our students in an environment where we don't have sufficient resources. I don't have a platitude for that. 
we do not have sufficient resources to do all of the things and serve all of the needs of all of us. And they think very, de as do I, think very deeply about how we manage that. So the provost and the uh, chancellor are making strategic decisions that also are very long lasting. You know, a faculty hire is a commitment for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So, so they think about that. And they, um, and I really hope that you will come back. The, the headliner uh, is, is going to be the chancellor who will be here on April 24th, I think. Somebody go like this. Anybody? Okay, thank you. Um, and and I think you you'll she, what she wants to do is really share her priorities, those longer term key priorities. And I think she has a very good sense of those, and that's going to be very exciting. I'm just like the warm up band for for that. So um, as you're aware, uh, and some of you won't, and I think part of this conversation is we're all coming at this at different times, and what we know is a little bit different. Oh, I'm getting the. Okay, um, is that uh, Berkeley has been operating with a structural deficit for about a decade. It didn't just happen. It didn't happen when they hired me. Uh, it was here before. Um, and the deficit was fueled by a number of factors. So, so again, all of this is on the website uh, already. Please feel free to take a look at it. But um, one, uh, number one is declining state support. So at its peak, it was about $506 million a year. And then the trough, it troughed at $283 uh, million. And today it sits at about $375 million. Um, you probably may also be aware that a couple of years ago, the president and the governor entered into a budget framework agreement. And um, as part of that budget framework agreement, there was a commitment to increase state support by 4% for next year. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that didn't, that didn't last. And so the, the uh, percentage is 3%, for, and we're using that for planning purposes for 1819. And just to put that in terms, that's about $7 million. It made a difference uh, to Berkeley. All right, and so after experiencing five years of frozen tuition, uh, tuition was increased uh, by 2.5% uh, for fiscal year 17, 18. Um, and as I just mentioned, uh, we're not really sure uh, what, what's going to happen. There are uh, actually three pieces to increases. One is the, you know, the flat, the base tuition. Uh, which is about $280 per student, rounding up 300. Then there's also a 5% increase for student services fees, and then there's a 3.5% increase that's been proposed for NRST. All of those are tabled for this for, for right now. And if I add all of those increases up for Berkeley, again, we're talking about a range that's you know in a $20 million range for us, for planning purposes. So it, it matters. Uh, and then um, the, the other fueling um, occurred in 2010 when uh, the system, UC, restarted the pen pension contribution after a 20-year holiday, uh, and that added about $125 million to our budget. So we went from zero to a 14% uh, contribution. Um, to, to, to help offset the unfunded li pension liability for the system. Um, and then finally, uh, state funding for capital projects was effectively zeroed out. So, that, so each individual campus is responsible for all of their uh, capital needs. And that had been in part funded by the state uh, prior to 2010. So um, in, I, I can't stop there because I don't want to leave you with only bad news. Um, in 2015-16, uh, you know, we launched a, an, an aggressive, uh, yet I think reasonable five-year plan to bring our budget into balance by 2020. So we're in our third year of our, of, of our turnaround, our financial sustainability goals. These targets were heavily negotiated with the office of the president and the governor's office. So going back to what's being part of, of our public mission. 
And our performance against those targets, which I'll outline in a sec, have been closely, closely monitored uh, throughout. And um, very uh, important to say that the Office of the President has been very helpful to campus in terms of moving us along towards our targets. So what were our targets? Uh, in 2015-16, our target uh, structural target was uh, 149 million. That was the, the deficit. We're talking about deficits, 149 million. And in 2016-17, we had a target to reduce that target to $110 million. And I'm really happy to report that due to a lot of hard work on the part of a lot of people, a lot of people in this room, uh, we surpassed our target and came in at a deficit of $77 million. I will say professionally, I've never been proud of that, but I, I think we are really making solid progress. 2017-18, um, the year that we're, we're in now, uh, we have a target of $57 million, and we are on track. Next year, our target is $20 million. This is fiscal year 18-19, and then we reach a balanced budget by 2019-20. And we're doing that without a lot of support from the state and without um, you know, it, 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 tuition increases. So I think we can be really, really proud of what we're doing, but it has happened with a lot of sacrifice. And again, I, 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 I don't wanna sugarcoat that. There was a lot of sacrifice that, that brought us to this point. So while meeting the targets is a part of this important pact with the legislature and the Office of the President, there's important reasons for us as well as a campus to, to reach this balanced budget. And I, I, I'll just begin by, you know, we have to stabilize our operations. Um, employees need to know that the place that they work is a stable environment and that they're gonna have a reasonable workload. Faculty needs to know that they're going to, um, that we're gonna be able to invest in their research and also ensure a reasonable workload. And I don't think that's happening all the time either. And students need to know that they can rely on services and support that ensure their academic success. And so to borrow an expression from our chancellor, we've got to move from being a place in which we just survive and that we thrive. And to thrive, we've got to get to a balanced budget. Secondly, um, we've got to, um, this is my opinion, continue to shift our reliance from less dependable sources to our own revenue strategies. And those revenue strategies have to be in alignment with our mission and our values. It, they have to uphold teaching, research, and public service. And I do think that there's a way that we, we, can, we can manage all of those objectives. Um, in fact, one half of our budget improvement target from for 2017-18 for is being made or being met through revenue generation. And I think this is a really exciting uh, opportunity for Berkeley as we look forward. Finally, the other really important reason is that um, debt is not issued by Berkeley. We do not hold our own balance sheet at Berkeley. We, we, there is a system-wide balance sheet. And debt is issued uh, by the Office of the President through these algorithms that have been established for each campus. And we're, we're uh, unable to go out to the debt market now because of our financial position. And this is really important when we think about, I can figure out funding mechanisms for housing, I can figure it out for auxiliaries, it's difficult for me to figure out funding strategies other than debt for our academic buildings. And as our enrollment has grown, we need to be addressing that. And we also need to be addressing deferred maintenance. I don't think that's any, in, you know, I think we all can agree on that. So that's uh, kind of like the big, big picture of sort of the context that some of these budget decisions uh, float around in. And uh, when you have an opportunity to meet with the provost and the chancellor, uh, in particular, our students, uh, all, all of you, all of us, we need to be thinking about how we can reach uh, people who are influencing our budget externally. How are we talking to the legislature? 
How are we showing up for the office of the president? How can we win support of our regents? And, and actually, you are the secret sauce in that. It, that. Those messages need to be heard from our students, from faculty, and from our staff. They see me and they are like, oh, whatever. Okay, so number three, um, who makes campus budget decisions in our annual budget and when are they made? Um, so I'm gonna take it down a notch now, talk about just our annual budgeting cycle, and I wanna begin by stating that it is a highly, highly, highly iterative process. And it is completely transparent. Please go to my website, not mine, our website, cfo.berkeley.edu. Not only can you see the budget processes, you can see each division's uh, financial performance, their strategies, uh, their targets, you can see their strategic plans, and then you can see the final budget decisions. Uh, and I think that that's um, something I encourage everyone to do to become better educated about the decisions that are made in the annual uh, process. The process in its entirety takes about five months. Uh, I like to say they're the best five months of my, my year. Uh, and, uh, and here's how it goes. Um, first, we develop a, a budget for that central ledger that we talked about, that 1.4 that flows in and flows back out again. And we establish these allocation envelopes. And um, then, and that, that's already happened, so that happens typically in January. And then in February, each unit, uh, and by a unit I mean like a division, so a school or a college or you know, administration, starts to prepare a one-page strategic plan for a three-year period. And then they indicate the actions that they're gonna take in the next fiscal year. Um, and then the provost invites small groups of these like units. An example might be all the professional school deans get together, and they discuss uh, their individual strategic plans with each other and the provost. And really the goal is to cultivate uh, these cross-functional programming opportunities. Then after we've gone through this process of a lot of listening, um, provisional targets are, are made for each of the divisions. So um, at this time, we don't typically, we, the, the budget office, we aren't in the business of setting budgetary targets for departments. That happens with the leadership of the school or the college or, or your vice chancellor. Um, but we, we do set it for the division and we're, we really encourage people who can to meet their targets through revenue generation. So reminder, we did it, ha we got halfway there in 2017-18 with, with revenue generation. Um, I, I, and I, I want to acknowledge that, um, that I'm very aware and I care about the burden that this is creating, these, these targets are having on the departments. Um, I, I, I think, you know, new academic, Programs um, are difficult to make a lot of traction against if you're already part of an overburdened unit, academic unit. And uh, I think administrative units who have heard rhetoric of uh, doing more with less, uh, that, that falls flat. Uh, and we're gonna have to think more deeply about the work that's conducted by administrative units because everyone's capacity to absorb more work is uh, gone. The, the deans and the vice chancellors then, so they've had these group meetings, then they're going back, they've got these provisional targets, they're talking to their teams, and then each vice chancellor, each dean meets individually with your, with your provost. Not a bad idea if you want to have participation in those decisions to know when that date is and to make sure that your team has had an opportunity to provide your, your, your leader uh, with the information that helps best guide that conversation. And then um, the units uh, that have revenue generation opportunities are um, submitting revenue projections to a, a new unit on campus that's called the aptly named New Academic Ventures at Berkeley or NAFB. And what this unit does is they sort of assess the health of those revenue targets and then think about ways that they can assist 
academic units in attaining the, uh, the goals that they've established for themselves. And then once the chancellor and the provost has gained the perspective of all of these meetings, they apply uh, strategic decisions to our budget as well. So I'll just offer one example. There's you know, hundreds of, th of things that they consider. But last year, it was, it was very important to us as a community that the chancellor make an investment in sexual violence, sexual harassment initiatives. So there's an overlay that happens. And then finally, after all of that happens, in about the March, a late March timeframe, finalized targets are released to, to each division. So that's how that process uh, works. And then um, that's question number three. And then lastly, I wanted to touch on uh, what, I, what I see as uh, priorities for our teams and how we can serve the campus. And uh, I would ask that on your cards, on the other side of your question, if you have ideas, I'm going off script. Um, if you, <laughs> it wouldn't be me if I didn't go off script. Uh, on the back of your question, uh, it would be really great for me to know how my teams can better serve you. I, I really would like. I really appreciate that advice from this group. So, um, uh, you know, we we just talked about our annual operating budget, um, but as I, I prefaced earlier, uh, there's there's an equally important part of our budget budgeting cycle that's often unseen, uh, which is how we prepare for capital projects. And this is a key priority for our chancellor. Um, we've reached a, a very critical point uh, in terms of our student housing. Uh, many of you may know that we only house 22% of our undergraduates and 6% of our graduate students. Uh, which we're, we want to, we need to make a lot of progress on faculty housing, uh, our classrooms, our labs, and then the infrastructure, uh, whether that be uh, IT platforms or or whatever that support uh, revenue generating ideas. Um, we also are very focused. We have a number of initiatives that are. Um, the, the, the intent of which is to improve tools for campus. Uh, we have uh, a new uh, financial reporting platform called Cal Answers Financials, which is intended to replace the Bears reporting system. Uh, and if you have not had an opportunity to take a look at Cal Answers Financials, it's amazing because it has a lot of drill down functionality built into it and a lot of filtering capability that we, we did not have in Bears. We also have a website that I'd love for you to take a peek at called R Berkeley. And at R Berkeley, we are sharing a lot of uh, frequently asked uh, data questions about enrollment, about our headcount, uh, about student success factors, about faculty workload, and take a look at it. And then um, it's really intended to be a communication vehicle so that we can have more collaborative conversations around campus and with our external stakeholders. Um, we're also, uh, because of uh, our financial position, really understanding where we are throughout the course of the year uh, so that we can make course corrections has become very important. So we're doing a lot of uh, forecast, forecasting revisions. We're looking at actualizing a lot of our forecasts. And then uh, we're also working in partnership with uh, the Vice Chancellor of Administration, who's in the back. You want to wave, Mark? Um, who, um, yeah, save all your tough questions for, <laughs> just kidding, I'm kidding. Um, we have a direct uh, travel uh, entry program. So now you can, you know, take a picture when you travel, take a picture when you travel and zip it right into uh, a, a direct, um, travel system, a number of the academic units have already signed up. We're getting great feedback and we, we're experiencing, like you get paid faster is the punchline. So it's, yeah, uh, and actually we've measured it. It's gone from about five, six weeks down to less than a week. So, you know, just saying, seems like a good idea to you. And then finally, we're looking at our reserves. So we have a lot of ending balance, uh, uh, what we view to be uh, uh, what we need for liquidity in our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, but uh, we have um, 20, over 25,000 funds. And um, most of them are, um, most of them, 
I'm just kidding. A lot of them are in arts and humanities, and a lot of them are like really small balances that are hard to use. And so how can we create some strategies that free up these dollars that sort of get trapped inside of some of these funds? And uh, we, we've just finished up, a, a, I think, about a six-month project to, to better look at it. So all of these things are helping us identify new funding sources for us uh, that help us make the, the investments in campus that we need to make. And I'm going to stop there. I know that was a lot. I, thanks for hanging in there with me. Again, we'll post all of this on the website, um, but I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. All right. Just over here. All right. All right, just a reminder to pass your cards to the outside ends where the students are collecting them, and I will pose the questions to Rose, um, and I'll start. You talked a lot, Rose, about revenue generation as a solution to our, our budget challenges. Yeah. Can you give me, give us some examples of what, what those are? Sure. Um, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I feel like I can't see you anymore. <laughs> okay, you're here. Okay. Um, so that's a great question. So, what was the question? Oh, oh, the question was, what are this? What are this revenue generation seems to be like a, the a magic bullet that we're all talking about, and I, I'd like some clarity on what what is meant by revenue generation. What are some examples of revenue yeah. generation? So examples are, um, I would say, philanthropy, but uh, philanthropy that we can use uh, for things that are budget relieving. Uh, so the chancellor's been. Uh, meeting with our donors and encouraging our donors to uh, perhaps relax restrictions that they normally would apply so that we can use more of our philanthropy for day-to-day -day operations, that's one. Um, in increasing concurrent enrollment, um, things like uh, growing our PDST and self-supporting degree master's programs. What does PDST stand for? Um, or what is it? Professional degree oh, okay. supplemental tuition. Okay, thank you. Stop asking hard questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and don't make me, it's uh, SSGPDP. Hmm. It's, let's just call them self-supporting degree programs. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, how can we um, grow revenues associated uh, with extension programs mm -hmm. or summer sessions? Great. So it seems like the, the, our inability to acquire debt or assume debt is a real challenge in terms of yeah. um, building new things and improving our buildings and maintaining our buildings at a very basic level. So, what are what are the solutions to that? I mean, w with a new governor, might we might that conversation get reopened, um, or is philanthropy the mm. only solution to that? Uh, well, I I think um, uh, I, I'm I'm not overly optimistic that. Uh, that a new governor is going to, and I don't think we should rely on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we should rely, it would be great if the legislature were to step in. I do think the Office of the President has made a very convincing case as to why that's important. Uh, deferred maintenance for our campus runs at about $700 million. I know you all know that. Uh, you know, you're in your buildings, you're working in these buildings, you have a good sense of that. But it is, it is a staggering figure when you add it all up. Uh, we have been able, when we talked a little earlier about how the Office of the President has been helpful to us, they have relaxed some of our uh, debt service expenses and have provided some funding for us to, to start um, biting off the deferred maintenance programs that we have. Um, and then trying to reserve the debt capacity that we have for our academic buildings, mm -hmm. and then um, using public-private partnerships for things like housing, parking, and auxiliary buildings. We're, we're a lot more creative in terms of how we think about funding mechanisms than, than we have been in the past, okay. out of necessity. Great, thank you. All right. I hope the first question is what my favorite color is. Mm, no. 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 Okay. Um, what are the big initiatives on the horizon to reduce campus reliance on unstable sources like the state? And yeah, so, so really going back to our own revenue generation programs. Um, I often say that um, 
you know, the most precious and valuable asset that Berkeley has is not a tangible thing. It is who we are. It is our brand. And it's very valuable. And I think we have some opportunities to explore uh, revenue strategies or, and, and I, you know, I'm talking about this through the lens of a, of a chief financial officer, but I think there's educational reasons that we need to be exploring how we can create um, educational opportunities that are not uh, just predominantly focused um, in the place, in a physical place. So I think that's uh, something that we're really excited about. Great. So we've got some tricky questions, some difficult questions coming sure. in, not surprisingly, and I know you'll be I, out. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. So a couple questions here about uh, the California Memorial Stadium and the debt that the, that, uh, the chancellor has talked about, uh, assuming a portion of that debt, and, and it's obviously quite controversial on campus. So can you talk a little bit about that yeah. and sort of what the sources of payment on that debt might be? Sure. Uh, could I offer a little sure. context yep. um, in case there isn't there obvious there has to be one person that doesn't know the the stadium story um, but we we've incurred about 400 million dollars of, of okay. is that okay to, okay mm -hmm. uh, of debt um, for the renovation to the stadium um, and that included the uh, Simpson high performance center as well and uh, that d debt was um, the debt that was issued was just sort of traditional debt, plus we also used century, about $75 million of century bonds for, for the stadium as well. Uh, our debt service uh, on an annual basis for current fiscal year for the stadium is about $18 million. There is a, um, a, a, an FFE or a, a fund functioning as an endowment uh, that does support the debt service for the stadium. And the source, the things that feed that endowment are the endowed seating program, plus uh, rentals and you know, events that occur at the stadium, and then uh, a large number of gifts that came from, uh, from donors. Um, and so the, the chancellor, and I would say we're in very early days, and we don't have all of the information that we need to finalize decisions. And, and Carol is very actively seeking input. So April 24th, this would be a great question for Carol as well. She's really seeking a lot of feedback from a, a wide variety of, of constituents. And she's been, so yes, it's serviced by this FFE, it flows through the athletics department's financials. You know, it flows right through. And uh, so um, she is considering, and, and no decision has been made, but she is considering um, that, that the campus would assume part of the responsibility and only a portion of the seismic related uh, work that was done um, for, for the stadium. And uh, I don't, I apologize, I don't have figures right now that, and I don't have a sense uh, in terms of how Carol's leaning in that decision, but that conversation is occurring. Great. Um, so can the system, the UC system, allocate additional debt for cash positive initiatives such as student housing? Um, yes, they could. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know. <laughs> You guys are so used to my long-winded answers. You're waiting for more to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the, the level of budget cutting that the campus has experienced over the last yeah. decade um, certainly um, erodes trust and yeah. um, impacts morale. How can campus leaders like yourself help to rebuild trust on campus? Um, well, I, uh, I want to begin by saying that the the chancellor talks so eloquently in a way I'll, I'll never be able to do about <clears throat> the key, the, the most important thing that, that leaders need to be doing on campus is re-earning or, or earning the trust of everyone on campus. She calls it re-spiriting Berkeley. And I, I think it, it comes from um, making commitments and honoring them. I think 
It also comes from being very transparent mm -hmm. about decision making, which is where I think I can contribute, and ensuring that everyone has, to the best of our ability, an opportunity to participate in the decisions that we're making for campus. Great. Um, another athletics-related question, and it's just it's general philosophical question that you may or may not have, have the answer to, but just philosophically, why are we in the business of athletics? <laughs> April 24th. <laughs> 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 Good answer. <laughs> um, there are some advantages to going first. Right. Um, what are, how will we provide additional services um, to an expanded student body um, with an increasingly diminished and, um, you know, fewer, fewer and perhaps less experienced staff? I, I don't know the answer to that, to, to be honest. I, 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 I take that very seriously, um, and I, I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I hear more of a statement than I do right. a question, and, and I want you to, you know, all I can say to this audience is um, I, I think about that every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about our students, and I, I think very deeply about our staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone has a very clear sense of serving faculty and serving students, and um, that, that there are times that staff falls third in the pecking order. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 I don't want that to be the case. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I hope that uh, Mark and I can serve as, you know, advocates and really ensure that campus leadership that's that's you, you know uh, the deans and other VCs the chancellor the provost that we can keep those priorities top of top of mind right that's helpful a couple more okay <clears throat> um, was that all of the questions or are you just being nice that's not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we're, the campus is um, embarking on a strategic planning process yeah. um, that you know that will have some financial implications. Yeah. Um, what are what are some things you're hoping to get out of that process, or what what are you um, excited about that they're considering? Yeah. Um, well, I, I I think having that roadmap and having consensus built around a strategic plan. Um, I, I, I often say that, uh, you know, the, the, the budget follows strategy. And without clear strategy, uh, I think all of us in this room have the experience of sort of winding and unwinding work. And that uh, we'll have the principles in place, that we'll have uh, the direction in place, that we'll have consensus uh, built around it, uh, that our, our faculty, our students, our staff, our external constituents are all rallied around that. And then I, I think it's easier for us to, to execute and implement. It speeds up once you have those principles in place. So you talked a, a bit about um, the, the outflow of funds to certain places, mm -hmm. and one of them being the Office of the President. Um, so this question is, we send a lot of money to UCOP. Do you think we get good value for those dollars, or should we be advocating for UCOP to lower their own costs? This is the best water. <laughs> <laughs> this question <laughs> uh, you know I, I think that there are uh, opportunities uh, for for greater efficiency um, uh, my dear colleague Nathan Brostrom who was the CFO here I, I think is is taking this very seriously um, but uh, my job is to protect the interests of Berkeley so here are some things that I'm I'm looking out for I want to make sure that as the Office of the President is reducing their budget, that they're not just cost shifting to the campuses 
or that they are creating uh, specific assessments for specific projects, like UC PATH. Um, that they're projects that, that, that we are participating in um, are gonna work, and that they're going to be cost effective in the long run. And the jury's out on, on a lot of that. Uh, and, and I'm very hopeful that the Office of the President is going to uh, be able to um, restore the, the trust uh, with the legislature because I, I think that's very fundamental to what we experience here at the campus level. Uh, that they, they've got to, you know, they've, they've got to hold hands and work together um, because the, ultimately the folks who pay the price for that, that, that mistrust are our students. Very good. Um, this sounds like a revenue, revenue generation idea, but are there plans to expand regular classes to evenings and Saturdays to accommodate more students and programs? Um, it's getting hard to meet, uh, to make ends meet without building out. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of that already happens, actually. I think there's a lot of, is that right, Jen? Yeah, there's a lot of, of uh, we are moving beyond uh, traditional uh, two-state, th Tuesday, Thursday from 10 to 2, and you know we're teaching more of our classes at 5 o'clock on a Friday. Uh, we, we, um, uh, and, and we are teaching Saturday classes. Uh, so, so I think uh, we're going to be doing more of that. And then I think an opportunity for us also is to reconfigure uh, the classroom space that we, and, and the buildings that we have. Uh, actually, Jen Stringer did an amazing job of, of a project like this in Duenel. Well, what's the name of that space? Thinking of the, uh, the active classroom. Yeah, the active yeah. learning classrooms. Uh, because students want to learn in, in different uh, classroom configurations other than you know, the 50 seat classroom. Or it's either that or these large auditorium settings. And, and pedagogy is changing, I, I think, how we think about classroom space. Um, so what what um, are the differential uh, sort of budget inputs from like a traditional undergraduate student and someone who's taking one of the one of our new online masters, our new professional masters? Are there different tuition levels? Is yeah, that's a great question, um, and I'm not going to be able to quote because um, some of my numbers. notes are like way over there. Uh, oh, they're here, but I don't have it. Um, is that the, the tuition happens, but I'm going to turn them over. Um, there are different tuition levels. Um, uh, most folks are responsible for a base tuition, which is about $13,000, just under $13,000. And then you have these supplemental tuitions that kind of sit on top of that. So non-resident students, uh, their supplemental tuition is about $20,000, uh, and then housing on top of that. Um, and then we, have, we also have different supplemental fees for graduate programs, uh, et cetera. And they, they do, um, they, they differ by program. Great. We are about at the end of our time. I want to thank everyone for coming. And we've got a bunch of questions that we'll let Rose answer on her own on, the web on either her website or the Campus Conversations website. Join us on February 12th when we hear from the provost, Paula Elavisados. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you.